The thing that's most important about science is that it's a way of knowing. And it's at the end of any kind of science activity, people will agree that they have collected evidence that illustrates a hypothesis. And if the evidence is contradictory to the hypothesis, one has to abandon that hypothesis and look for another one. And one must, in testing any hypothesis, or trying to establish it, consider all of the relevant evidence, which may come from all kinds of places, observations, measurements, and so on. And insofar as people can be objective at all, they will come to the same sorts of conclusions. Science is a fundamentally useful and accurate and universal way of finding out about the world. So scientists always have to collect information, data, observations, and measurements around an idea that's being tested for its validity. And if all of those observations and measurements corroborate and are consistent with the basic idea, then it has got to be published and be available in an open and transparent way that others can criticize. If the hypothesis is really correct, the criticisms are stand up. That is, a scientist has no better friend than valid critics, appropriate critics who to whom they respond. And if the criticisms lead to abandonment of the hypothesis because the facts don't fit the idea, then the hypothesis must be abandoned and replaced with something more adequate. And as science goes on, the adequacy of the basic idea and the hypothesis is corroborated over and over again by lots of people from lots of angles and usually generates sub-hypotheses or, or related ideas that can also be investigated. But of course, science is never secret when it's done right. I would say that there's no bad science, there's just lots of things that are called science that aren't science, because science is a way of finding out that is self-correcting and involves many people over and over again the same observations or observations that are generated by the hypothesis itself. Anyway, these are kinds of rules that international scientific people will all agree on. Science isn't science unless it's published, unless it's openly published and made available for criticism by anyone who feels that they can criticize them. Okay, three buildings come down at almost the speed of free fall, which is the gravitational speed. And for two of them, it's because airplanes hit them. And for the third one, it's a mysterious reason. That is, there's no really coherent hypothesis, except it's claimed that there are these fires in them. Now, the most obvious hypothesis for anyone looking at the films, and that was a lot of people, is that the buildings came down because there was very carefully controlled demolition with high explosives that had been planted many weeks, if not months, before. The first thing they do is ignore, in all cases, the most obvious and reasonable hypothesis that is consistent with all other destructions in a very short time of buildings. And what is worse is that all of the evidence was removed. You can't do science without evidence. Unfortunately, there was a lot of evidence about the pieces that the columns were broken into, the nature of the uniform nature of the dust. But very quickly, if this is a crime, I think everybody agrees it's a crime, evidence was removed from the scene of the crime. Well, if evidence is removed, no scientist can possibly reconstruct what happened. You can't do science when you are deprived of the evidence and when your hypothesis is the least valid instead of the most likely. When the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned. This is not science. So the claim is that it's something else. It's trying to prove preconceived ideas. Not having data that they could fit, use to make a model, but to prove a model that was unprecedented in the history of buildings collapsing. So we're not doing science here. We're not doing bad science. We're just not doing science at all, is my claim. So what, to me, is most impressive, since I do microscopic work all the time, are the many, many microscopic samples that show these extremely, totally unique red-gray crystals, red and gray in the same crystal, and it was found in all the dust samples. So the preconceived notion of NIST is that there's no evidence for explosives, and so there's no point in looking. 
uh, that is the most unscientific thing that you can possibly think of, not to look because you don't expect to find evidence, and in fact the evidence is overwhelming that these red-gray crystals are very high temperature incendiaries, and so they have a lot of evidence for something they have no explanation for, they don't even look at it, they ignore it completely, ignorant and dismiss the explosive argument, and on the other hand, give an argument that's patently false that no scientist will accept that fires, office fires, can bring buildings down at the, at the speed roughly of gravity, of free fall. They state these conclusions for which there's virtually no evidence and then they ignore conclusions that can be drawn from the evidence. This is not a, a scientific procedure at all. Rule number one, probably, of, of crime investigation is to collect at the scene of the crime as much evidence as possible for what happened. And, in, and you had these steel columns in nice, even pieces, and they were whisked away, and evidence was destroyed or removed systematically, extremely uh, close to the time that the crime had occurred. This is not only unscientific, it's illegal. Many witnesses, firemen and lots of people described flowing molten metal, iron or steel at extremely hot temperatures and John Gross categorically denied their observations so that because their observations don't fit his preconceived notion he not only ignored evidence, he denied evidence that is exactly the opposite of science, which considers all of the evidence that can possibly be relevant and builds a hypothesis based on the plethora, the total of evidence. So clearly, if you have to lie or deny or ignore evidence, you are not doing science at all. I don't, what you're doing is lying, basically. Scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. De los productores de 24. No, that was lovely. What's that? Step backwards. It means he doesn't believe what he just said. He's lying. My witnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers. And uh, scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. So this is what NIST has done, denied and ignored crucial evidence. It doesn't fit their preconceived notions. So NIST hires this UL, this Underwriter Laboratories, and, and they do their work, and they show that the floors did not fail, they did not give way. And then NIST doesn't like that result because it doesn't fit into their computer model, so they ignore the real result, and they misrepresent and pr provide evidence from authority that uh, the computer model is right. Well, people do this every day, and they call it science, and the people who do it call themselves scientists. I claim they're not doing science at all. They're doing propaganda or, or publicity or whatever they're doing, but it's not science. It's a process Darwin called dissent with modification. But it all begged a question. It's not playing by the rules of science. You have a, a sharp eye for what you call propaganda. Versus, yeah, well, versus bullshit. truth. That's what they taught us. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we said, that's we not unique to science. <laughs> Did you go into science because science has more of that? No, because science was not a question of your political opinion or your orientation. It seemed to me that science was a way of finding out directly about the world from evidence. and. Uh, I had never seen that in my life. I had only seen people saying, you do that because he said so, or you do that because he knows more than you do. And you know, I was a typical, you know, but I'm sure everybody's subjected to where the arguments are from authority. You read it in the book and it's got to be true because it's in the book. And Jacques wasn't like that at all. So um, your major contribution to science, perhaps, and though you have many contributions, you, you're a noted uh, experimentalist, you're a noted theoretician, but it's perhaps the theory of symbiogenesis, the idea that uh, evolution didn't arise slowly through a sequential series of mutations, but that arose by adventitious, perhaps, 
intimacy of strangers, that is, uh, organisms coming together in mutually beneficial ways, not intentionally, of course, but in ways that would then provide positive selection material. Yeah. Um, this Can I rephrase that a little bit? Please. Not because you haven't done a nice job, but you fall into a f trap that it took me 30 years to get out of, no. and that is to use words like mutually beneficial or cost-benefit analysis and so on. I, I object violently to that terminology because yeah, I can see we, that. We, we, what we don't want to do is name organisms by the outcome of their relationships, which is of course what that is. Yeah. But, and, and rather than say, um, rather that organisms, new organisms, novelty evolves mostly, not mostly by uh, random mutation, I would say, or you said not by random mutation, I think that's what you said. Yes. I would say that random mutation, of course, does play a large role in, in evolution. But the concept is that random mu mutation is never enough to go mm -hmm. from one species to another. Right. At random with respect to selection. So what random mutation changes in DNA, of course, can be documented. They exist all the time. But what we're saying here, and we have lots of documentation, which I'd love to tell you about, is that when you get something really novel, that is a new species, a new organ, new tissues, new organelles, new features in evolution, it's never by random mutation. If you take a Drosophila and you mutagenize it with a chemical mutagen, an x-rays or something like that, that's, you get a sick Drosophila, you don't get a new species of Drosophila. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what's been shown very recently is that if, you, if, you, uh, if some of these insects actually acquire mycoplasmas or other Wolbachia type bacteria, they can in one fell swoop um, now metabolize new nitrogen compounds. They, uh, in, in just the acquisition and integration of bacteria will change that insect uh, dramatically. So, so there are discontinuities, like you said. And of say. course, bacteria is so diverse, so there are so many opportunities. Yeah. My, yes, my favorite example, which is so graphic, um, and maybe Paul Falkowski on this campus is going to invite me back to show this, show this to you, is what we call green animals. These are animals. They're slugs, uh, snails without shells. They're worms. They're completely recognizable. One of them in the film that I'm telling you about, one of them is, belongs to our chordate phylum and it looks like a little tadpole. In all of these cases, the hydra is another one, the coral is another one. In all of these cases, under starvation conditions in the light, you know, they're, they're in the light, they're marine mostly, and they're starving, they eat algae, and usually they digest the algae. But the algae will put up, uh, or cyanobacteria, will put up a fight. And when they put up a fight, they resist digestion, and they continue to leak. And the net upshot is that the animal, the f animal's food becomes the animal's body. And in these cases that I w will show, the animals have become completely green. And they r inherit the greenness to all of the offspring. So in any given population of these animals, for example, Convoluta roscafensis, which is on the coast of Brittany and the Channel Islands and now Spain and England, these worms look like seaweed and they fix carbon into photosynthate like seaweed, <laughs> but you get close, they have muscles, they have mouths, they're completely green and they're photosynthetic. Now they didn't go from a translucent worm to a completely photosynthetic worm that lies on the beaches and photosynthesizes as if it were a plant. They didn't do that step by random mutation. They did it by acquisition of a microbial genome and the integration of the genome. That's what we're saying. Uh, that's what and we're it's saying. always been very difficult for people who study evolution to understand how you can acquire something as dramatic as a flagellum or a cilia or photosynthesis. And I think Where there are many genes, there's right. thousands of genes involved. And, and yes. this gives us a view of evolution that suggests that, if I may use a word here, that evolution is punctate. It is that punctuate. It, it occurs gradually, and then there are great leaps exactly. when this symbiogenesis occurs, exactly. and then it's gradual, and then exactly. another leap. But I don't want to get more credit than I'm due at that either. There, are, there were um, several, there's a wonderful book by a woman called Khakina, and she's the second generation of people who've studied this. Laya Nikolaevna Khakina, and it's called um, uh, Concepts of Symbiogenesis, a Historical Critical Study of the Russian Botanists. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. in the 19th century, Mereshkovsky is the most notable one, Konstantin Sergeyevich Mereshkovsky 
wrote many papers, like La Plante Commun uh, Communité Scientifique, the plant as a scientific community, where he argued that plants, all of them, were the products of symbiogenesis, and they had gotten uh, photosynthetic photosynthesis secondarily. And this stuff was floating around, but it was repressed for at least a generation. Mm -hmm. And I had teachers who at least had us read, not, not in Russian, but in the English translation, some of these people's work. So I was aware of this, of this work, and they deserve a lot of credit. But the experimental methods weren't there to test it. Y con cuatro ya tenemos las células de plantas y algas. Y de, con tres, las células de animales, hongos y casi todos los eucariontes. Y con nada más dos, y eso tenemos que hablar, es decir, debajo de condiciones anóxicas, que quiere decir sin oxígeno, había los primeros eucariontes. Estamos trabajando en exactamente eso y la gente no sabe, no se sabe por qué. La gente no conoce nada de la vida eucariótica sin oxígeno. La definición de arqueoportistas son organismos que nunca, nunca pueden respirar oxígeno, que no tienen mitocondria ni en ningún estado de su desarrollo. En este grupo se ve el origen de mitosis. Eso es lo, para mí lo más fascinante, porque la diferencia grande entre bacterias y células con núcleos es el proceso de mitosis con cromosomas, etc. El proceso más importante en el origen de la célula eucariótica de nosotros, animales, plantas, etc., es adquisición de genomas o capturando genomas en el sentido que no es una bacteria que se, se puso muy grande a la vez con mutaciones al azar.